Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming to the forum for this uh, panel this evening on uh, a great and important man, Ronald Reagan. Uh, this is an all-star team that Harvard has assembled. Uh, so I'm, I'm Mark Halpern of Time Magazine, and I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way and let these four people talk. Um, this is a, uh, an opportunity for, for people who, who didn't know President Reagan to hear from four people who did, and Mrs. Reagan. I'm going to uh, try to get a sense of the audience. I'm going to ask you all to vote by show of hands. And, and if you're uncomfortable voting in front of others, close your eyes as you vote. Uh, <laughs> ra raise your hand, if you, besides the four here, if you ever met President or Mrs. Reagan. Raise your hand. All right. Raise your hand if you were alive when he was president. <laughs> <All right>. Yay! <laughs> um, I, I, was, I was an undergraduate here uh, during my entire time here uh, when, uh, during the Reagan presidency. So he was the, the, la the only president, uh, the last president I didn't cover as a professional journalist. And I've met every president since then, but I have never met President Reagan. I've met Mrs. Reagan. I was fortunate enough to be invited to an event at the Reagan Library last year and for the first time got to meet her and spend some time with her. But for me, this is a, the same treat that I hope you all find it to be, which is a chance to hear from people who can bring to life President Reagan uh, on this, in this important year and to tell um, stories about him in a way that will, will try to give you a sense of, of why he was such an important and historic figure and a, such an impressive man. Um, I want to mention two people very briefly uh, who recently passed away who um, had ties to both Harvard uh, and, and, um, and to President Reagan. Um, and and uh, one is David Broder. Uh, I think this is probably one of the first public events here since uh, David Broder, the Washington Post, and Lou's longtime colleague passed away. David is a former fellow at the Institute of Politics and, and covered President Reagan as he did uh, presidents uh, for a very long time. Uh, so I wanted to mention David and, and, and talk of, and, and, and the fact that all of us are thinking about him. The other person I want to mention is Reverend Peter Gomes, who died just a, uh, 10 days ago, I think, uh, and who um, took a little flack in, in what he always referred to as the People's Republic of Cambridge. Uh, for speaking uh, at President Reagan's, um, they were doing the benediction of President Reagan's second inaugural. Um, and uh, when Reverend Gomes was asked, um, you know, w why'd you do it? He said, well, he did take a lot of heat. Uh, but when people said, you know, why were you willing to pray for Ronald Reagan? He said, think how bad things would have been if I hadn't done it. Um, that, is, uh, that is very much in the spirit of. of that's, that's why yeah. the inaugural was inside. Exactly. Not outside. <laughs> That very much in the spirit of Reverend Gomes, and again, I wanted to note his passing and, and the fact that we're all thinking about him. So let me now uh, introduce the panel and get them talking about President Reagan, and I'll just introduce them briefly because I know you all have internet access, and if you want to read their full biographies, you can. Um, start with, on the end with Professor Roger Porter, who worked in the, um, the uh, Reagan administration, uh, chief of domestic policy, and is now, of course, a professor here at Harvard. Uh, all these people also work for other Republican presidents, uh, including Professor Porter. Next, Lou Cannon, longtime Washington Post reporter who wrote many books about President Reagan, including one that the current president was recently spotted reading, thanks uh, maybe to Ken Duberstein. Uh, and Lou is, is uh, really, you don't have uh, anyone today, or for the last several presidents really, with the stature of Lou. Lou was considered uh, as someone who covered the White House for the Washington Post and wrote so frequently about President Reagan and with his deep ties to California, uh, had uh, a relationship, professional relationship with President Reagan and the Reagan presidency that was dominant and, again, unmatched by anybody covering this White House or any White House since then. Uh, next, Sheila Tate, who worked with Mrs. Reagan as the White House press secretary uh, and who now works for, as the vice chairman of Powell Tate Public Relations with a long experience working with lots of different people, but her time with uh, Mrs. Reagan, I think it's safe to say, was probably your most high-profile position uh, uh, as a spokesperson for someone in public life as a first lady. And then finally, Ken Duberstein, who's on the board here at the Institute of Politics and served as uh, President Reagan's chief of staff during the last few years of his time in office. So again, these are uh, uh, people with so much deep knowledge. I want to just get them talking to try to understand as, as best we can both President Reagan and the times in which, in which he governed and lived. And let me start, Lou, with you and ask you to tell people, uh, again, all of all all you've written about the president, tell people uh, what you think the essence of President Reagan was that particularly younger people here who have no real sense of him, what's the essence of him that made him a distinctive leader? 
It's not easy to distill in a few words. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan was asked at the, uh, uh, on the eve of his election uh, to the presidency in 1980 uh, by a radio reporter, uh, uh, what is it that people see in you? And he said, uh, 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 would you laugh if uh, I said that uh, 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 people uh, 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 see me as, as one of them and that I've never been able to think about myself as being apart from them? Um, Walter Lippmann famously wrote that the greatness of de Gaulle was not that he was in France, but that France was in de Gaulle. And I think the greatness of Reagan was, was that America was inside him. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan is an elusive person in American history. Uh, the silliest thing that has ever been written about him, and I pro probably contributed my share to that, was what you see is what you get. Because what you got in Reagan was a lot more than what you saw. There was uh, uh, a deep abiding uh, 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 faith in country. There was this, this enormous love he had for uh, Nancy Reagan. I think there was a really a spiritual quality to Reagan, although he was very uh, 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 conscious of not wanting to wear it on his sleeve. He wasn't one of these people who uh, who liked to to go to church in public and uh, and and there was this wonderful abiding sense of humor that connected him with people. You know, what kind of a governor will you be? I don't know. I've never played a governor. Uh, you know, uh, I figured nobody ever. He said, I I I know it. I know no one ever died of hard work, but I figured, why take the chance? Now, <laughs> Ronald Reagan. The thing that when we started covering him in, in the 60s, we thought other people were writing the one-liners for him. And that was the first thing in which I was disabused. And I'll just stop with this one more because you could go on for a very long time. But in the, in the 1966 gubernatorial campaign, where uh, Reagan's opponent, uh, Governor Pat Brown, who had been, been a, a good governor of California, who had kind of worn out his welcome, Pat loved to say that uh, he'd been doing great things for the state of California while Ronald Reagan was being upstaged by a chimpanzee in the movie Bedtime for Bonzo. So uh, an AP reporter named Doug Willis got, uh, got a, a studio picture of Reagan and Bonzo and brought it to Reagan to auto autograph. And Reagan cheerfully autographed it. And underneath his autograph, he wrote, I'm the one with the watch. <laughs> <laughs> Pro Professor Porter, um, one of the things that was said about President Reagan during his presidency, including by a lot of people here in the People's Republic of Cambridge, was that he was not well-versed in policy, that he was divorced from the details of the office, and that that uh, caused him to pursue policies that weren't rigorous and well thought out. What's, what's your view of that from having worked with him on policy? Um, that was a very commonly held belief. Uh, and a belief that was sustained for a fairly long period of time by many people who I think didn't get a chance to spend around him. What I discovered, somewhat to my surprise, because I had only met him on one occasion before I went to work for him in January of 1981, when he very first came in, was that he would read everything you sent him. And he had an incredible memory. I mean, he could remember the facts of what we're in. <clears throat> and that if he didn't understand something uh, to his satisfaction, he would ask about it and get it clear in his mind. And he was quite comfortable in dealing with a whole range of issues at the level of what is it that we should do and what is the right thing to do. I never got the impression that he thought a lot about the political calculations of how this might affect him electorally. But he thought a lot about how am I going to get this accomplished? Because he'd spent, well, Lou knows this better than anyone, he'd spent his entire 
go uh, governorship in California dealing with the Democratic legislature. And so when he had to deal, and Ken knows a, a lot about this because you started out in the Office of Legislative Affairs, he, he had to deal with a Democratic House and in the last two years a, a Democratic Senate as well. And so he was comfortable in trying to figure out what is it that we need to do to get this accomplished. But the, the idea that he was disengaged from policy was one that uh, I found in practice was not, in fact, Where uh, did it come from? I remember my deep. Time Magazine. <laughs> yeah, it could, could, it could have been. As long as it wasn't human events. <laughs> um, I, I, I remember um, Mike Deaver um, coming into a senior staff meeting one day, and the president had been up till 3 o'clock in the morning reading all the material that had been sent him last night. And obviously, uh, Mrs. Reagan had discovered this and was very unhappy about it and uh, passed it along to Mike. And Mike rarely said anything in senior staff meeting. I mean, Ken, I, I don't know if you can remember. I, I don't remember him ever speaking more than on two or three occasions. <laughs> when we got near the end of the senior staff meeting, and Jim Baker, who was chairing it, said, uh, Mike has something he'd like to say. This is kind of this chill went through the audience, and he said, uh, the president was up until 3 o'clock this morning reading all the papers that you people sent him. You see, he believes if you think it's important enough to send him, it's important enough for him to read it and understand it. And everybody was looking around like, how many papers did I send in last night, and how long were they, and et cetera. And he said, you know, he has 14 meetings on his schedule today. It's not fair to him. It's not fair to the people whom he's going to meeting with, be meeting with. So we've got to get this under control. And that's when it sort of dawned on me that Reagan saw the job as if these people think it's important enough to send, I am going to do it. And so he was a very diligent uh, reader. Can you? Let, let me add on a few things. Ronald Reagan was always very comfortable in his own skin. People could take shots at him. Lou could write a critical article, and he would just rub right off. He knew why he wanted to run for president. He knew what he would do when he became president, and he went about trying to get that done. George Herbert Walker Bush yesterday, in a salute to Ronald Reagan, talked about Ronald Reagan as the ultimate pragmatist who understood my words, not President Bush's words, that progress is in bite-sized pieces and not in Hail Marys. And so Ronald Reagan always tried to figure out is how I could advance the ball down the field. Tip O'Neill used to say, I don't like compromising with Ronald Reagan because every time I compromise with him, President Reagan gets 80% of what he wants. And President Reagan would say to Baker and Deaver and myself and others, I'll take 80% every time and come back the next year for the additional 20. That's the art of governing, which Reagan understood absolutely. Mark, just briefly, because I don't want to no. take uh, Sheila or Jenny's time, but I, I, I think there's this great writer, uh, of another era, Douglas Cater, who wrote the fourth branch of government, who, I, which I, some, I think, up here probably have read. I hope some of you read it if you haven't. And Doug wrote a novel. It wasn't a successful novel, but it was, he had some wonderful stuff in it. And one of the characters in the novel says, you get a reputation when you come to Washington. You know, you're lazy, you're hardworking, you're liberal, you're conservative, you're honest, you're a womanizer, whatever. And all the, all the hounds of heaven and hell can't shake that reputation. Ronald Reagan was tagged deliberately uh, uh, by, uh, in, when he ran for governor, uh, he was, the campaign against him was, it, it, it had uh, what, what the social scientists would say, cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, he was this dangerous extremist. On the other hand, he was this empty-headed actor. And it was the, an actor was used as a synonym for airhead. It was a very bad campaign thing in, in California where, 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 
for better or not, and maybe we're all airheads, but we think highly of actors. <laughs> and uh, so, so Ronald Reagan essentially had that, in a, in a sense, I hate to say it, that after all he achieved, that is never completely left. It's Reagan the actor. I deliberately chose the words, the role of a lifetime, as a subtitle for my book because I knew how much Ronald Reagan valued being an actor. Some people thought it was a put down. He didn't, and it certainly wasn't meant to be. But Before I jump, yeah. let me just jump in for one second. At the end of the presidency, the day before the end of January 20th, January 19th, we had a farewell for him in the East Room of the White House with all the White House staff. And I am seated, and in part of my remarks, I said, Mr. President, you started out to change the country, and you wound up changing the world. And Reagan, in response, said, not bad for a B-movie actor from California. <laughs> and everybody just busted up. There's the humor. There's the self-deprecation. And there is, and there's he's the one pride, of us. pride in his craft. Right? Exactly right. <laughs> well, Sheila, I want to ask you about the media environment in which the Reagans had to operate, much different than the one we have today, not the 24-7 news cycle, but still an unrelenting interest as there always is in our, our first couples. What was the Reagans' posture towards that relentless pressure from the media? What was their attitude towards the kind of coverage they got? Um, well, first of all, it was the... We were right on the cusp of the 24-7. CNN started in 81. And in fact, I spent a lot of my time dealing with the other networks not wanting CNN to, to be in the pools. And, uh, yeah. and that, was, that was one of the issues. But, but you're right. I mean, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have bloggers. We didn't have all the things that are going on today. And, and um, so you had time. But the Reagans attitude. Let's see. Nancy Reagan cared a lot about what was written about her. And she, what she said to me was, I will always be available to you, which is, I mean, a press secretary can't ask for more than, you know, having a boss who will answer your call, even if you call seven or eight times a day. And sometimes I had to. Uh, she said, I'd rather that than be surprised at something. I want to know. And um, she would, she had pretty good instincts. She, um, you know, if she was going to do something and the council was, this is not going to go over well in the press, her attitude to that was, it's worth it to me. You know, I'm going to redecorate the White House with private funds because it's in terrible shape. It needs it. It's a historic home, and I'm going to do it, and I'll take the heat. That was one of our first issues. I'm going to order China. Um, um, she didn't know it was going to be uh, unveiled to the press, well, it was leaked to the press on the day that the Department of Agriculture declared ketchup a vegetable in the school lunch program. <laughs> and uh, the, so the, the editorial coverage was just brutal on that subject. But even, you know, Ronald Reagan uh, talking about his ability to communicate and his his ability to to really get to the heart of the matter and to really understand. I was struggling with this. I mean, White House China issue. This is this is these. He he finally went before a news conference and he said, and all these people attacking Nancy for these dishes. Oh, why didn't I think of using that word? That's what they're dishes. They're not China. They're dishes, and and uh, and it was funny how that story just sort of faded away. Not a case, not of any preparation or the staff giving. It was a it was an instant, uh, honest appraisal of him, uh, right. you know, on his part of what this issue was. Right, Lou. A lot of the coverage of, on this anniversary of the president's um, has has focused on his time in the White House. Uh, but talk a bit about his time as California governor and how that uh, informed his attitude about how to do the job of president, about what, about the way to work with the legislature, the way to uh, deal with the press, all the challenges of being president. I, 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 uh, I will do that. And I hope I'm not being disrespectful to you, Mark, to add on to, to what Sheila said. Uh, Sheila was a very, very good 
press secretary, and she was very good for Nancy Reagan. She was very good for George H. W. Bush. She was very highly respected among uh, among uh, reporters, and I think somebody ought to say that. So I just did. Thank you. But but <laughs> but, but I remember this. You know how you remember some things. Yeah, when you get to be my age, you can't remember what you had for breakfast, but you can remember some <laughs> things that happened a long time ago. This was in the 76 campaign, and I and Reagan was running for uh, the nomination, and Ford ultimately won. And the, we were in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and, and Reagan was doing a series of very quick interviews with all the members of the Traveling Press Corps. And so I did mine, and, and I remember Lynn Opsinger was with him, and, and I'm starting to leave the room, and, and, uh, and Reagan said, Lou, can I ask you something? And I said, sure, uh, Governor. We called him Governor until the day he was, became president. And he said, there's this column that was in the Washington Star, which was then the competitive paper, and it was written by, by a woman uh, uh, whose name was Judy Backrack, and it made fun of of Nancy Reagan's legs. Right. It was a nasty column. And, and it was, uh, and, but on that same day, in the same paper, there were about seven columns saying Reagan didn't know important parts of his anatomy from a hot rock, that he was wrong about this, that he was wrong about that. And Reagan, all Reagan didn't care about any of it. All he cared about, he said, why would anybody write that? She said, you know, crying, up all night. She said, you know how it is if you're a husband. I mean, why would somebody write that about your wife? He was just so wonderful. And I happened to know by a total coincidence, because I was read. I had a column. I was reading, and she happened to be, like, she had eight places that were syndicated. She happened to be in next to last in the bottom of the syndicated column. And I said, and I told him that. And I, I said, I, I just happened to know this, Governor. Oh, good. He said, I'll tell her that. <laughs> and he was, and it was so wonderful. He was, just, he was really being, some of you, my, my wife's program, favorite television program of mine, are The Good Wife. And wife well, he, was being the, he was being the good husband. Uh, California helped him in almost any conceivable way. When I wrote about uh, m m the book that was, a, it was kind of, I guess the television people would call it, a prequel, because it was Governor Reagan, is uh, I, the one thing that everybody agreed about who had worked for Reagan, and I mean everyone, Ed Meese and Bill Clark, and people who, uh, uh, other people who didn't agree with each other, Cap Weinberger, they all agreed that he wouldn't have been able to be the president he was without being governor of California. And Reagan went further. He said to me, I don't know if I could have been president without being governor of California. Uh, in Cal he, was, he, was, he came in at a time where California had a lot of the things he'd face in Washington. It had a, it had a deficit. It had a very, very highly articulate, able civil service that was not going to give any new governor, Reagan or anybody else, a slack. It had a, a Democratic majority with uh, Jess Unruh uh, as the leader, one of the finest Democratic state legislator leaders. Uh, 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 I shouldn't say Democratic state legislative leaders there's ever been in. It had a fractious Senate with people all over them. It was a mirror. It was kind of a if you were if you were doing the, if you were writing this as a fiction and you were foreshadowing it as a, a novelist would do, you'd say, well, you, you, you're relying too much on coincidence. And Ronald Reagan had a hard time being governor of California. He learned. He was a much better governor of California in his second term than he was in his first term. So Ronald Reagan had been through an awful lot. And uh, when Tip O'Neill, and Kenny, remember this, t t I think it was one of the most revealing things that Reagan ever said to me. It was that a, it was, he'd met, I think it was December of 80. He'd been elected. They came back to Washington. They met with uh, Tip O'Neill, and Tip was a, was a, you know, house speaker, and Tip liked to pull people's chain, and he said, well, he said, you've been governor of California, that's the Bush Leagues, this is the major leagues. All the people who were there with, with Reagan, even including Mike, were kind of furious with O'Neill afterwards. They thought, well, this, this was, this was uh, being very disrespectful to the guys that's been elected president of the United States, and I asked Reagan about it. Reagan was sort of happy about it. He said, I, he says, I, I don't think it's, 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 it's a disadvantage to be underestimated by the Speaker Absolutely. of the House. Absolutely. And I always thought, this is, this is the telltale story. 
Reagan has an idea of what he wants to do in office. And like all presidents, some of it he was able to do and some he wasn't. But, but he had a, 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 a basis, the, 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 the superstructure under this big tanker, you know, that was coming in there was the governorship of California. And he really had learned, learned from that. Two weeks ago, I did a panel uh, on the Reagan 100th birthday with Tom Brokaw, who said, Duberstein, you may have been good in the White House, but the reason you succeeded legislatively, because Reagan learned how to deal with the legislature in California. Right. He understood that meeting that Lou just talked about, where Tip dissed him, my word. Not Tip and one of, and one of the other, And one of the things that we did right after that is set out to go visit 435 house offices, to knock on doors, to get to know people on the Hill. And this was during transition. This is before we moved into the White House on January 20th, to start building the kind of relationships so we knew who we could go to when we were putting together the coalition on taxes and spending, because we knew where the votes were and we knew where the districts were that Reagan was strongest in. But it all started with Reagan's understanding from California and how did you deal with the legislature. It goes back to the fundamental point that Ronald Reagan understood, which is that in order to win, it's not building a consensus in Washington, it's building a consensus in the country, and Washington will follow. That's what he was about. That's what- But he also had this capacity to relate to the people who yep. he was who he yep. was dealing with. I remember once coming through the West Lobby, which is where people would sit on the couches before they were going to go in for a meeting with the president. There was a Democratic member of the House there, and uh, I went over and shook his hand and said, "What? What are, you, what are you doing down here?" And he said, "You know, I'm I'm going in to meet with the president. I don't expect that I'll ever vote." for anything that you guys send up. But, and this was three and a half months into the administration, but he said, I never met President Carter during my first two years in the House. And he said, I'll never forget this. I may never vote with you, but I'll never forget it. Well, he didn't vote with us, but he happened to be a subcommittee chair who is in the position to block a lot of things if he wanted to. And because of the uh, relationship that he established with President Reagan, he helped facilitate things from happening, even though on a floor vote he was not going to be out there voting. And, and Reagan had this capacity to connect with people, even who disagreed with him on policy. Can I, I got a great story that is just like that, same, same point. When when the Reagan's daughter, Patty, was getting married, his parents, they were from Montana, and his parents were meeting the President of the United States and the First Lady at the Bel Air Hotel um, the day before, in the, the week, just the few days before the wedding, first time they'd ever met him. And I saw them walking in, and these are, you know, really salt of the earth people. And I stood there looking and I kept thinking, what must it be like to be in this position? Your son's about to marry the daughter of the president and you're about to meet him. And you've never been to California. Within five minutes, I noticed the mother and the father and another woman standing in a semicircle around the president. So I went over to see what was going on, and he had taken his new hearing aids out, and he had them in his hand, and he was telling them the benefits of this new hear these new <laughs> hearing aids. And then one woman said, we have got to tell Aunt so-and-so about this. <laughs> I mean, it was like they had known them forever, and Ronald Reagan could do that with anybody. I've seen it. He did it with Chris Matthews, for God's sake. <laughs> and Chris Matthews' father was in town, and Chris Matthews got an invitation to come. Yeah. And 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 he, I mean, he said, uh, you know. Well, as Lou said, he was one of us. He was America. Yeah. He, he could relate to anybody. He, you know, he he worried that 
if people came out to see him, he had to see them. This goes back to Roger's point about all the reading. I had the privilege of being in the limo with him many, many times. <clears throat> he had heard a story that as the limousine kept going through crowds, Jimmy Carter, when he was president, never looked up. And Reagan said, if people spend the time to line up to see their president, I need to wave back at them. And so the limousine was catching everybody because we saw the president and he waved at us. Oh my God, he's a real person. And that built the momentum. And I, I, think, uh, I, 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 I was going to ask, Lou's got a great insight in terms of how his eight years as governor of California helped prepare him. Because many in the audience who are younger may not remember the situation that he inherited when he came in. Right. Uh, we'd had 52 hostages uh, held in Tehran for 444 days, and this had preoccupied the country. During the previous 24 months, between January of 1974 and December of 1980, the Consumer Price Index had increased at 25 percent. It was the only two years of back-to-back double-digit inflation <coughs> we had. We not only had rising inflation, but rising unemployment. Economists had previously told us this wasn't possible. There was this wonderful thing called the Phillips Curve, which postulated an inverse relationship between inflation and other unemployment. And now we had the worst of both worlds, rising inflation, rising unemployment. The prime interest rate in December 1980 hit 21.5%. Mortgage interest rates were 17.5%. I mean, most presidents feel like they're dealt a difficult hand when they come into office, but I mean, he had an extraordinarily challenging situation. And I was in the meetings with him at the beginning. I remember Alan Greenspan giving him a briefing on the economy and telling him it was absolutely worse. It was worse than he had thought it was. And I watched Reagan very carefully, and he didn't look worried. He didn't look anxious. He didn't look overwhelmed. Um, he he gave evidence of somebody who was comfortable being in the situation of dealing with difficulty because he had a set of principles that he had developed over the course of a lifetime that he believed in and that he was going to follow. And it, uh, when you're around someone who is confident without being arrogant, it translates into the people who are around them and he gave a set of uh, people who were working around him who were obviously much younger than he was, a degree of confidence that he knew how to lead. And the country was not there. I mean, Ken deserves partially the credit since he was the last chief of staff. But Ronald Reagan left office with a, an approval rating 12 percentage points higher than when he came in. Most presidents have uh, an approval rating that declines over time, and his actually went up during that period. There's a great irony to that. The irony is, is that Reagan had campaigned a good chunk of his adult life against uh, government, and uh, people had a higher opinion of government when he left <laughs> office because so much of what we think about government is associated with what we think about the president of the United States. I just want to say one other thing. It's I don't. It's, I just don't want it to get lost here because I think it's an important thing. And uh, even though we all up here know it's important, and I've written about it, I, I tend to for, forget it. Reagan did a couple of things right away that were very important. One thing he did, that beca because Reagan never had a majority, you know, he never had a majority in the House of Representatives entire, right. and he needed... And that meant he needed every Republican. He needed a unity. Uh, and, and, and one of the reasons he got, he, Plus there were a couple of reasons he got unity besides this guy, uh, who was a very superior at, at his job. The first way he got unity was he, he united the Republican Party, I think, in a moment when he put George H.W. Bush on the ticket. I think right. that, was, that was, a, a, was really a very, a, 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 it was something that I wrote about, believed he was going to do. And, was glad he did it, and I think it, it, it really helped him. The other thing he did, he this has never before happened in the history of the Republic, and I'll bet it 
I may, it may happen again, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a large amount of money on it. He chose, you talk about a team of rivals, and he chose the chief of staff of his opponent, his last two opponents. I mean, uh, 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 Jim Baker, who I think was the best White House chief of staff that I know of, Except was Ken Duberstein. I, said, I mean, I, I put Ken, no, I, I, I'm not going to break. I'm a Baker boy. So. Yeah, he's, uh, we're, I don't think we're going to, anyway. Jay, Ken, Ken, Kenny was a great chief of staff, and he was, a great, he was great at everything he did. But Baker, Baker was in a situation where, where he is all of a sudden representing the, the, the guy who had defeated his, his guy. And Baker did a lot of things. But the thing that always impressed me was that he said, and I, uh, Kenny will catch me up on this if I'm wrong, but Baker said he never let a call from a member of Congress go unreturned on the same day. And that's pretty remarkable. Now, you have to, you, you also, in, in this life, it's who you follow and who follows you. And he was following Carter, and there were an awful lot of those guys who never gotten a phone call. No. Democrats, I'm talking about, never got a phone call from Jimmy Carter. And, and, well, it's and, not only returning their phone calls, it was making them. Yeah, and, <coughs> and so here's this guy all of a sudden who is communicating with the people who, after all, are going to have to pass this budget. And if you go back, and I know the fact that Reagan was almost killed uh, in this the terrible day on March 30th had something to do with it. But if you go back and look at what all of us were writing in the Washington Post, let alone what they were writing in the New York Times and Time and Newsweek and all everybody else, there didn't seem to be much chance at the beginning of that of that of 1981 that any of that stuff was going to be passed, and uh, 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 it's quite it was it was really quite something. It was really quite something what they did. I mean, uh, to to get every Republican on board, to reach out to Congress that way, to have people like like uh, Kenny talking to Democrats and Republicans, and and then Reagan reaching out to the country. It was, if you look back at, at it in history and you look at what it looked like at the beginning of the year and the way it came out, it's quite an extraordinary look, performance. We had 191 Republicans. Ronald Reagan understood that in order to be an effective president, he had a win on Capitol Hill, <coughs> which meant keeping every Republican vote and adding at least 27. We thought we had a pool of about 80, and from that we could draw people. One of the things that we did beside the big speeches and the great communicator and responding to all the congressional phone calls was we figured out, and Bart Stupak will know this and appreciate this, we used to ask the president to call the congressman back home in his district. Because if you call the congressman in his district office, it's a big deal. If you call on Capitol Hill, oh, it's the White House calling. But all of a sudden, it's chatter back home in the district. What did the president want? Oh, he asked you for your vote on what? Oh, you're going to give Reagan a break? And all of a sudden, it starts building up that kind of interest. Ask, and that kind of you, and you may remember, in connection yeah. with that, you may remember that you guys used to give him a list of people to call right. and typically call them on their birthday, among other things. And. Um, or anniversaries, uh, this, or kids' birthdays, right. or whatever. <laughs> and this was, uh, this was after he had been shot, and he was still recuperating, and he had not yet made a public right. speech. And I think you'll remember this story. And there was a congressman from Pennsylvania who was in his district. Eugene a Atkinson. Exactly. Right. And the president doesn't phone these people. The White House operators call and get them on the phone. And then the president comes on the line, and the White House operators tracked this member of Congress down, who happened to be on a call-in radio program. <laughs> but that was not apparent. And so uh, the first words that Americans heard that the president, after he had been shot and spoken, were in this conversation that he was having with the member of Congress, where he was congratulating him on his birthday and wishing him well, et cetera. Can so, I want to ask so you the, wait a minute. So the governing part of that, <laughs> the governing part of that is that the first contact with Eugene Atkinson took place during transition, where somebody on my staff went to visit him and pointed out that Reagan had won 62% of his district. Right. And he said, look, I want to be helpful to the president on the budget. 
as Bart knows, saying you want to be helpful in the budget and voting for it are two different things. But we at least thought we had a shot. And so we went back, and then the president, with the assassination attempt, and he was making phone calls. And if you talk about Reagan and the luck of the Irish, little did we know that it was a live radio call-in show that was recorded. And somehow Sheila and the press operation got that recording to every network. <laughs> and so everybody in America, the first time they really heard President Reagan's voice was talking to a congressman asking for his help on the budget. In his pajamas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I want you to, to clarify something that's now uh, talked about quite a bit, which is the relationship between the president and Tip O'Neill in the context of Washington now, where there's so little genuine interaction between presidents of one party and members of Congress of the other. People say all the time they would get together and drink. Did they often? Did it happen 10 S times? St. Patrick's Day. How often did it happen? How many drinks did they have? Reagan would always finally say, it's 6 o'clock, we can be friends again. And Tip O'Neill would call him at different times and say, is it 6 o'clock? Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, always, it's always 6 o'clock for you. Uh, you uh, know, I, uh, I remember a lunch that we had for Tip on his birthday with Jim Baker, Mike Deaver, the president, and myself. And the two of them, for two hours, told old Irish stories. And Mike finally said, well, the two of you got to get back to running the country. And Tip said, oh, I got one more. And so he, Reagan wasn't going to leave it. And it went on for another almost hour. But During the whole lunch, the only thing that Baker, Deaver, or I said was, don't you guys have to go back to work? <laughs> now, the trick was, when you wanted them to negotiate with one another, it had to be all pre-cooked. Because philosophically, they were so far removed that if you left any wiggle room, they would be two old Irishmen, and they start yelling at one another, even in the Oval Office. And I have this great memory of David Stockman, who was the OMB director, encouraging Tip to come down. We had a meeting, and Tip said something, and Reagan flared, and Tip flared, and Stockman, no, 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 I can take care of it. I can handle it. I can find the magic asterisk. I can make this thing work. <laughs> so the relationship was one of friendship even though there were philosophical differences. There was one more, one more little thing. The <laughs> night before we invaded Grenada, <coughs> we had a secret briefing upstairs in the residence. We had the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the Secretary of Defense, et cetera, and made the compelling case why we needed to do this. And this was in light of the Marines who had been killed in the barracks in Lebanon. And I will never forget, the meeting concluded, and there was Tip O'Neill. Everybody got up, and Tip went like this. God bless you, Mr. President. God bless America. And if you don't think we stood as one that day, that's what's missing today. And here is the Speaker of the House, liberal Democrat Massachusetts, Ronald Reagan, California, Governor, now president, derided by many people, and they came together and said, God bless you, Mr. President. That's what's missing, I think, in the political system today, that coming together. Excuse me. No, I, I, that's, that's the right story. Tip, tip, huh? tip gave Reagan a lot of help on Lebanon. It wasn't just, just right. doing it. I mean, he, uh, I don't think that, uh, I, I say this as a critic of the whole deployment, so I, I'm, I'm not overjoyed by what I'm saying, but I don't think we would have been able to sustain that deployment uh, without without Tip. And uh, the only thing Tip ever wanted <laughs> was he wanted to, as I said, I said this at the lunch today, was to be ambassador to Ireland. And Reagan was perfectly willing to give it to him, but by the time he offered it to him, as you'll remember, Kenny Milley was too too sick. Uh, uh, and I think the where well, this is about Ronald Reagan, but. Tip O'Neill brought an awful lot to the table, folks. He, we, what, what we're, we're, we're lacking today is, is in some, uh, Tip O'Neill always put, always put the United States of America first. He never put his party first. I, 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 I had many conversations with Tip about different things. Tip said, oh, you're up there covering that Reagan, you know. You, but Tip, yeah. Tip always, 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 despite all of his partisan reputation he had, 
he, he, looked, he looked at the big picture as far as our country was concerned. And, and uh, to me, uh, you know, you, you, want, you want different kind of leadership in the White House maybe, but I, I also, I want a different kind of leadership in Congress. I want, I want Tip O'Neill back. Yeah, let me just add to that. The other relationship which people don't know about is the relationship between the Kennedy family, and here we are at the IOP and in, in the Kennedy Forum, and the Reagans. The first phone call I received when President Reagan died was from Ted Kennedy, who wanted me to convey to Nancy how much the whole family had respected and remembered Ronald Reagan for what he did for the country and what he did for the Kennedy family. The Kennedys had not been in the White House for the four years of Jimmy Carter, and within the first couple of months, the Reagans invited the Kennedys in. When the Kennedy Library was raising money, it was Ronald Reagan who went to Teddy's ha home in McLean to host a fundraiser and be the headline of it. And as Teddy said to me, you know, Ronald Reagan sometimes didn't remember your name, but he always remembered his goals. That's a hell of an epitaph. Excuse me. Well, the Kennys were pretty good uh, uh, haters, as probably being as well as being the number one political family in America, and people that I admired, and and uh, I, as a Catholic, I have been raised to think that nobody Catholic could ever be president. That was one of the greatest moments in my life when when John F. Kennedy was elected, but. When Carter was president, a lot of people have forgotten this, but I'll bet you no Kennedy has ever forgotten it. Uh, uh, the Congress had this method, struck this medal for the, the Ethel Kennedy. And President Carter, for reasons be on my political comprehension, never refused to award this medal. And I don't know who it was. I think it was Deaver who told, uh, uh, Kennedy would know, uh, Deaver who told Reagan about it. And Reagan said immediately, oh, let's do it. Let's have a ceremony <laughs> and award the medal. And, and I was at that ceremony. And Frank Mackowitz and all kinds of people who have believed me over the years had said so many bad things about Reagan and never had a good word for Reagan came over to me. Well, he said, uh, like, like I had something to do with this. I, your guy, he says, may not be what we want as a president, but he's a big guarded man and he right. knows what to do. And they, the, no Kennedy has ever forgotten that. And, 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 and Reagan grasped it. But the curious thing is, I don't think Reagan really did it for political well, advantage at all. I, I think Reagan did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. Let me, let me stop. I want to yeah. ask Sheila a question, then we're going to go to questions from the audience. Um, the, the story between the president and the first lady, an incredible personal story and a huge uh, part of his time in public life. What, in the presidency, what did he rely on Nancy Reagan for from the, part of the official parts of the job? What kind of advice, what kind of situations did he turn to her? Um, he turned to Roger for policy advice, and he did not turn to Nancy Reagan for that. Nancy yeah. Reagan, I think, my evaluation is that her greatest value to him was the antenna she had for the people around him. Right. And if somebody was pursuing an agenda that was in conflict with or not helpful to the president in some way, she, uh, she was, would not be happy. And she would, she, I mean, it might take some time, but she would begin to discuss that with him. And, and it's that kind of influence that I saw her have over the time I was with her. The, the other part to that is Ronald Reagan trusted everybody. Yeah. And Nancy was the verifier. Yeah. Well, that's that's the, the way it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The famous c comment about Donald Reagan, he liked the sound of chief but not of staff, uh, <laughs> which, which I, which I, I uh, as soon as I heard Nancy say that, I knew Don Reagan. I didn't know how it was going to happen. I knew Don Reagan wasn't going to be White House well, Chief of Staff. Well, let me tell you, when I... I will you know, I returned every one of her phone calls. <laughs> the, I loved it. When I, I knew he wasn't going to last, when I sat next to him at a dinner, and he'd been there a year, and he said, you know, I don't know. He says, I, you know, Nancy Reagan calls all the time, and he said, 
I've decided, he says, I like your idea of this. He says, I, I was thinking about hiring one of her friends from California to come and, and take the calls. And I thought, your days are numbered. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's and, not and, the way it works. Yes. And when, <laughs> uh, Sheila was absolutely right. When I was chief of staff, sometimes she would call once a day and sometimes 10 times a day. I found her as my best ally because she gave me a reading on him. And there are some times, frankly, that I would call her and ask her to weigh in, that I wanted him to see a picture that I couldn't provide. And if she agreed, she was willing to do it. But the idea of the two of them, he was always better when she was in the equation. And she was always better when he was there. And, and the, the, probably the last most important point on the whole relationship, she took a lot of criticism for being overprotective of him, for, for wa watching his schedule. The staff tended to crowd it, and she tried to slow it down because she knew the pace that he operated best. And I observed later that years later when he was dying, Nancy Reagan was doing exactly the same thing. She protected him from um, any unnecessary stresses or issues the way she always did. And suddenly, the press got it. You know, they figured it out. That was that had always been her role, and nothing had changed. Let me, let me ask, the same it was thing. a true love affair. Let's okay. ask people who want to ask questions in the audience. There's a microphone there and a microphone there. Please go ahead and start lining up while people line up and formulate their questions. Uh, Roger, I'm going to ask you just one big rapid round gimmicky okay. question. One way the current president is most like Ronald Reagan and the way he's least like Ronald Reagan. Well. Um, well. Reagan is. Well. well yeah. <laughs> um, he's, he's like Ronald Reagan in that he came into the job without ever having experience in the executive branch of the federal government. And uh, in that respect, it's a, it's, a, it's a big job. And if you haven't worked there before or haven't seen it up close, it can be a little overwhelming. The way in which I think they are similar, and I, uh, I only know this at a distance because I don't have the kind of insight uh, inside the Obama White House. But the impression that I have is that he trusts the people around him in the same way that President Reagan grew to trust the people who had the opportunity to work around him. Uh, it is very clear that he trusted almost everybody, almost to, uh, to a fault in certain cases. And I think uh, the First Lady was a real asset to him in terms of helping to create a, a a sense of reality there, but he had a he had a, a great capacity and was willing to trust the people around him. We're going to go to audience questions. As always, standard rules apply. Identify yourself. Ask a short question that's actually a question. No speech or declarations of candidacy. Great. Hi, my name is Ariella. I'm a sophomore in the college. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the, the legacy of President Reagan. Um, many politicians today try and make the claim that they, in fact, embody his legacy. And I see that often mislabeled. So I'm wondering if you could speak to both sides, namely um, a claim that you've seen that might be mislabeled as such, and also a genuine claim and what you see as the true legacy of the president. Lou? Uh, Ronald Reagan's greatest legacy is that he and Gorbachev together gave us a safer world. We had the power to destroy each other co countries. Uh, you know, it's a it's a Soviet official, Alexander Besmertnik, who said the experts didn't believe, but the leaders did. They both worried about accidental nuclear war. They 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 work together. It's almost it's it's it almost puts them both. It trivializes what their accomplishment to say. Who was more important than the other? They neither could have done it, done it without the other. That's the most important legacy, uh, as Alan uh, Brinkley says about. Uh, I'm sorry, Doug Brinkley says about uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. We don't remember whether or not he balanced the budget. <laughs> you know, we, we 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 remember that he saved the Union and freed the slaves. What we're going to remember about Ronald Reagan is he made the country strong, 
and but he made the country strong for a purpose, a means to the end of, of, of making us uh, uh, less dependent on nuclear arsenals and nuclear war. Sheila, one of the most enduring legacies of President Reagan is, to this day, Republicans seeking national office talk about Re President Reagan more than any other uh, and, and, um, uh, and put themselves forward as someone who will be an heir to the Reagan legacy. Who have you seen, to, to follow up on that question, who have you seen since Ronald Reagan left office who you think is most obvious heir to what he stood for, what his legacy was? Well, uh, George Bush Sr. was um, uh, campaigned on continuing the Reagan legacy. Um, I think that it, I'm not going to fall for that trap because I don't really. I, I think that it was the, a friendly trap. I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I think but a that trap nonetheless. <laughs> that Reagan's leadership and strength derived from his character, and I don't think we have seen anyone uh, of that specific kind of character. He, he was a man who was larger than life in a lot of, a lot of, even to the people around him. You had a, sorry, you had a sense when you were with him that you were with a very unusual and special person. Um, and he had the trust of the American people. And I think um, that's the kind of thing people have to aspire to, they can't claim to have. Okay, question here. Let me, let me none of the above. And one of the things that I think bothers some of us is that he's being appropriated by the far left and by the far right. And the answer is Ronald Reagan was a doer and a pragmatist. Baker and I and others in Deaver may have been accused of not letting Reagan be Reagan, but as Lou will point out, as he did often in his columns, Reagan was the ultimate pragmatist. And the person who sometimes we had to hold back but remember, he was president of the Screen Actors Guild, so he learned how to negotiate. I, 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 would, I would share Lou's view that transforming the relationship with the Soviet Union was an enormous lasting legacy. And, and it almost, the, the key Berlin Wall speech almost didn't get done because the State Department objected to language in the speech. And no, I he, brought he's it. The, he's the one who wrote it in. And I, no, <laughs> Peter Robinson wrote it, and the State Department wanted it out. Reagan kept it in. And <laughs> I went to him, and he asked me, and I said, I thought it was a hell of a line. And he said, let me look at it, and read it, and said, I think we'll leave it in. On the day as we drove to the Brandenburg Gate, he was rehearsing the speech one more time. And no matter how good of a great communicator he was, he was reading it, even though he was going to do it on teleprompter. But we got to that section, and he said, it's going to drive the State Department boys crazy, but I'm going to leave it in. And 20 minutes later, tear down this wall, Mr. Gorbachev. He was that kind of a bold stroke primary color leader. OK, question here. Good evening. My name is Matt Shiraki. I'm a graduate student here at the Kennedy School. First, I want to thank you for being here. I also wanted to thank the forum staff for putting this great event on. Uh, Mr. Cannon, you've written in your, in your books about how when you go back uh, to Illinois and you check the records, how um, every house that the Reagan family moved to in succession uh, got lower and lower income, uh, it was smaller. And I was wondering, just given his own personal upbringing, his personal roots and challenges, I was wondering if each of you could comment on the role that President Reagan's personal life, um, what kind of a role and what kind of dynamic that had in the way he viewed uh, his presidency and the way he treated each of you and how it shaped his policy agenda. Very big topic. Well, I'm going to try a very quick answer, which is not uh, that's a, a, a much better question than my answer will be. Uh, Reagan, the, the, the line which everybody in this stage will remember, Reagan used to say that we didn't li live on the, on the wrong side of the tracks, but we li li lived close enough to the tracks to hear the whistle. Right. And Ra Reagan had a, he, he had made his way in difficult times, you know, and he was always an optimist about getting a job when people weren't getting jobs. Uh, and I think that was both his strength and a weakness of it. The strength of, of it was that Reagan was 
always believed that you would get ahead in this country. He always believed that the future was going to be better than the past. Uh, the weakness was that sometimes it didn't leave him with enough appreciation with the people who couldn't, uh, uh, who couldn't make it uh, as, as he had done. But the other thing I want to say, I think the most, best thing that has been said up here tonight has been said by, by Sheila. I think that, 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 that Reagan's strength was in his character. And Reagan's character was enormous. I mean, the only, you know, we had a long relationship. He didn't say very many personal things to me. He did say once to me, out of the blue, and it surprised me so much I didn't know what to say, that he thought that one of the reasons that I was interested in him was because uh, I, I also had an alcoholic father who also happened to be named Jack and, you know, had a similar, similar background. And I don't know why he said that. I don't know why he knew it. It was certainly, certainly true. And it's very hard for those of you who've had the experience, I'm sure there's many in the audience who have, of uh, being, being, being the child of an alcoholic. Uh, that's a struggle. And being the child of a nomadic alcoholic who moves around. Reagan never, he started a different grade in every, in every, one of the reasons Reagan, Nancy Reagan believes this is the reason for his, the distance that he kept, that he didn't have any friends except his brother as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a boy, because you're in a different school every year. To overcome all of this stuff and to do the, to achieve, suppose he had been president. To be this, he was a, a terrific sportscaster. He was, a, he was a, an actor just below the rank of top star. He was, a, he was the host of a television program that had for seven years the highest ratings on Sunday. And he was governor of, of, of the most popular state. If he hadn't become president, that would be an enormous um, uh, an achievement. You know, and he became president of the United States as well. So, so this, this, this is a, a guy who really learned from, and he had a lot to learn from, and he, had a, and, and he did not have an easy... He did not have an easy row of it. Yes. My name is Sophie Fry. I'm a sophomore at the college. On a slightly different track, if President Reagan was here today and looking at the Republican candidates for 2012, who do you think he would endorse and why? That's I can an, answer that because he wouldn't. He, yes. he didn't believe in endorsing in primaries. Correct. Who would he no. want? Well, he wouldn't well, endorse. Well, well, I know, but who would be his? Who would be his choice? He would not endorse nor select. <laughs> well, he wanted George H. W. Bush, even though he didn't endorse him. And I, I don't know. Uh, uh, who's, uh, that's a good question. I, I, wh who do you think, Roger? We were talking. We were talking about this over, yeah. over, over a drink. Not Roger. He doesn't drink. But we were <laughs> still talking about. We were still talking about it over a drink. I drink. <laughs> I drink. Uh, I was sober. Uh, well, Roger weighed right in. Who would who would he secretly be for if the Republicans out there? I actually think that he wouldn't get involved. I, I, I think this was not an act. I just think he, he had this 11th commandment, speak no ill of another Republican, and uh, I don't think he would have uh, left in. I do share the view that's been expressed that at bottom he was very much a pragmatist and that he would look for someone who had the kind of qualities that he thought he had. Uh, and that, that Sheila encapsulated wonderfully in her but he definition did, he did of him as a character. Beliefs. But he had a core set of beliefs, yeah. and you always had the sense that he was grounded. Yeah. And it made a huge difference in, in debates and discussions, because there are always going to be people who are going to be different with one another, that there was someone there who had a core set of beliefs, yeah. and you knew what they were. We're doing a spectacularly bad job of answering your question. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's uh, clear. It was an honest answer. He would not have endorsed. He, he wouldn't. wouldn't have been selected. He would have had hands off. But yeah. Lou's comment about the television program for seven years, GE Theater, yeah. reminds me of a wonderful story. In the dusk in New Jersey, in a small country road, we were campaigning in 1988. We came around a corner in the limo, and there was this old lady with a big sign. And it said, we loved you in GE theater days, but we love you more as our president. <laughs> and I pointed it out to Reagan, and I said, that's the best sign, handmade sign, I've ever seen about you. And Reagan says, second best. <laughs> Ohio State University. 1984 campaign, 10,000 students, 
He's old, but he's cute. <laughs> <laughs> question, question up there. Hi, I'm Josh Archambault. I graduated from the Kennedy School last year. Thank you so much for being here. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, his legacy once he left office. We see President Carter and President Clinton trying to build their legacy now. What could other future presidents learn from those around him, what he did, what they say about building your own legacy once you've left office? Well, Alzheimer's deprived him of, right. of, of the opportunity, I think, to build the post presidential legacy. That's my view. Yeah. In the first year, he was very religious about not commenting on his successor, which yeah. was George Bush. He thought any president successor has to have his time in office. And by the time he was, I think, thinking about commenting, it's the onset of Alzheimer's. But he was always very, very proud of George Herbert Walker Bush yeah. and the job he was doing as president. Good, thank you. There, up there. Hi, I'm John Soda. I'm a freshman at the college uh, from Turkey. I have a question about the Cold War. I think we sort of got, got at this a little bit. Um, many people say Reagan won the Cold War, and you know others say, well, Reagan didn't win, the Soviets lost. I was just going to ask for your stance on that, and if, if you think... Uh, I, I was wondering whether you could explain his role in uh, bringing the end of the Cold War. Let me tell you a story that took place in Governor's Island in New York Harbor in December 1988, where President Reagan brought President-elect Bush along to meet with Mikhail Gorbachev. Ceremonial passing of the torch. Seven Americans, seven Russians. Gorbachev was in New York at the United Nations. He started the lunch off by expressing concern that his policies of glasnost and perestroika might not work, and they were being thwarted by the then bureaucracy, the nomenklatura in the then Soviet Union, and he didn't know whether or not it would succeed. And he turned to President Reagan almost as an older brother and said, what insight do you have? And Ronald Reagan, could have been GE theater days, said, the bureaucracy is the same the world over. And Mr. General Secretary, the only way you can overcome the bureaucracy is to get the people on your side. And the only way you can get the people on your side is less money for missiles and more for consumer goods, less money for the military and more for housing. And you could see in Gorbachev's eyes that either way he turned, he was screwed. Because either he alienated the military or he couldn't get the civilians. To me, that may have been the moment in my way, not the Berlin Wall, where I realized that what Reagan was saying was fundamentally the end of the then Soviet Union. Mr. Gorbachev has said on many occasions that we all won the Cold War, <coughs> and I agree with him. Uh, time for one last quick question and answer. <coughs> Great. Um, Mark Anderson. I'm a student across the river at the business school. Um, my sorry. question, it was mentioned, uh, <coughs> uh, it was mentioned <laughs> earlier um, that uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, a very spiritual person, didn't wear it on his sleeve, but um, it's something that I, I haven't heard talked about as much. I'm just curious what those who had kind of personal interactions with him ob observed of his faith and, and, and um, if, you know, if that was an important part of his life. I think he was far more religious in thinking and doing after the assassination attempt. Had it manifest itself. Well, he yeah. said, in fact, yeah. he yeah. said afterwards that he believed he'd been spared for a reason and that whatever time was left to him, he was right. devoting to, to uh, the good of the country. And, and I mean, he, he, he clearly was touched spiritually by it. And, and it, and it, talk about a, an example of a, a man's great leadership. The way he handled the aftermath of that assassination attempt was amazing. I mean, I stood in the hospital corridor when he was going into surgery and he lifted the mask and standing right across were Baker, Deaver, and me, this morose looks on their face. They're looking down like this. And he looks up and he said, who's minding the store? And that was the beginning of a series of Joe, he went, then he gets in the operating room and he says to the, uh, to the doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. Right. That kind of, that was, that was really happening and to this guy. And the doctor's answer was, 
Today, Today we're, we're all Republicans. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and that gave him moral authority, but it also, right. he, he said, geez, what was that guy's beef? You know, that was the way he yeah. wanted to know what happened. He, he, was, he was very spiritual, and he, I know they had, they, they had services at Camp David, but he really didn't like the idea of going yeah, in right. public and he, disturbing everybody else's experience. He always had a spiritual side to him. His mother yeah. was, right. Nell, yeah. was a very uh, uh, spiritual woman. She was also uh, uh, a great uh, theatrical person, funny. She dressed up. She taught, she, they're not, just as conservative and pragmatist, they're not opposites. Being, being religious, you know, and, and uh, 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 having fun are not, not opposites either, and she was a, a fun-loving woman. But she was, she believed that everything happened for a purpose. And believe me, if, long before the assassination attempt, if when I was first interviewing Reagan, if I had a ten-dollar bill for every time Reagan said that everything happened for a purpose, I would be independently wealthy <laughs> because he really believed that it's a Christian doctrine. And, and, and Re Re Reagan was was, it, but he didn't want to convert you. He didn't want to go out and proselytize you. He didn't want to bother with your religion. He, he would not do it in, in public, but as Ken pointed out, he had this very interesting relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev. And one of the things that's now been revealed about uh, one of the summits that he had is that Reagan took about half of his time to lecture Mikhail Gorbachev on the importance of religious freedom in the Soviet Union and that if you were going to have a successful society, it had to be based on the opportunity that people had to worship freely. And when he took the victory lap, the so-called victory lap, uh, about a year after leaving office and went to Berlin and went to Rome and et cetera, he first, when he went to Russia, first went to St. Petersburg and went to a church there. And it was full of worshipers, not just the old, but many of the young. And then when he went to Moscow and met with Gorbachev, he again urged him to do everything he could to establish a greater freedom of religion right. in, in uh, Russia. Let me, Go ahead. let me conclude with a story. President Reagan was convinced that there was Christianity in Mikhail Gorbachev's background. The agency always said no. They could find no indication of it. At Governor's Island, in response to a question from George Herbert Walker Bush, the answer that Gorbachev gave was only Jesus Christ knows the answer to this story, to, to that question. It's a budget. And Colin Powell and I looked at each other and said, aha, okay? So when we left the meeting, I called somebody at the agency and said, Reagan's right. <laughs> And they said, oh, no, it's a slang expression used in the Soviet Union. It doesn't mean anything. Three years ago, maybe four, I was in London. And I picked up a copy of the International Herald Trib. And Gorbachev had been in church and said he was renewing his Christian vows. And I said to myself, if Reagan were only alive today, <laughs> he knew it. He was right. Ken, thank you. I um, okay. want to thank all four panelists uh, helping us to uh, this important year to thank you. Yeah, sure, to, thank you. to try to bring President Reagan alive. Thank you all for coming and to the forum staff for putting it on. We appreciate it. Good night. Oh my God! I know. Right.